let's turn to Galatians chapter 1, please. You know what? Say there in Galatians chapter 1. Welcome, Gavin. How you doing? Good. Good. Good to see you. Are you going to want to speak Sunday? Sunday? Yeah. Testimony. I, I, was, I heard we're having a testimony Tuesday. Yeah, we are. We are. You want to save it for that? If at all? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's see. Sorry, we uh, felt like a dead sprint there for a minute, and then uh, just throw something on there for... At the end, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Galatians chapter 1. All right, let's pray. Father, once again, we are thankful for our time together on a Sunday. Or I'm sorry, it is a Wednesday evening. Uh, pray you bless our time together. Help us to learn. Help us to apply these truths to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so as we talked about last week, evil, I'm sorry, false teachers had crept into the churches of Galatia. Uh, let's just go look over there real quick. Now, remember in the timeline here, I brought my glasses up here this week. My pleasure. And so you see here in this form how Galatians right here was written during the third missionary journey from Corinth, about 58 A.D., and then here we put all three of the missionary journeys. Of course, there was a fourth missionary journey, but people just can call that generally uh, Paul's journey to Rome. So in the third, the three missionary journeys you see up here is Galatia. So even in the first one, before we ever went to Europe, this is modern-day Turkey. And then over here you see the word Galatia, and then in the second missionary journey spent a little... A little less back and forth, but remember it was Troas right there, right next to the Aegean Sea that he got the uh, Macedonian call and then went across there and then now the gospel is in Europe. So the third missionary journey here going back through Galatia again. And uh, so you see all of that, but the trip was quick through here. Well, I say quick, straight line and then came to Ephesus, one up and over, but here, so all this would have been written from Corinth back to the churches back here. All right. Any questions on that? What had happened then on these churches of Galatia is false teachers had crept their way into the churches. Now, previously I had pictured Harper. We just yell at each other. It's like cheers. Remember that old show? You just, everybody, somebody walks in, we all turn and yell. There's a bar in Eugene that does that, and I now have to tell you how I know this. Oh. <laughs> Back in my group on days, because you know we tried to get pubs on there, and there's Sam's place over by. I don't know what road that is. It's kind of over by the Lowe's and all that, Home Depot, over on the other side of Eugene. And, uh, but I went in there trying to make a sales call, but I walked in the door and everybody turned to the door and went, hey! <laughs> <laughs> all right. And uh, so, yeah, took me back to my uh, Cheers days of watching Cheers and then turned into Frasier, which has now turned into Frasier again. But I don't know about you, but previously I had always pictured these false teachers in Galatia as people are walking in, they're, they're wearing their priestly garments, they look like Pharisees, Sadducees. After now, how many years, 24, 25, however many years of you know, going to church and being in some sort of leadership role, my idea of who's doing this is differently, is different now. Um, I see here, I see whisperers. 
I see those that would go around and find somebody and question things, everything that's going on in the church, but never coming to the staff, never coming to leadership. Uh, yeah, man, we've seen that quite a bit. You know, people go to other people, but don't go. It, there was one particular family, and it, I, there would always be these activities, things go on, and there would always be reports back that somebody was working the crowd. And not one time in all those years came and talked to me. Now, the new Nick Gillespie actually would walk up to you and say, hey, I heard you got some questions and, uh, and cover some of those things. Uh, matter of fact, in this new scenario, it wouldn't be me, but however, uh, we would see it happen. Uh, but, you know, those sort of days of just kind of letting people do whatever, you know, you know, question everything we do. Right? If you have a question on something we do, talk to us, right? We want that. We welcome it. But when you're trying to just get somebody who you see as an outsider somewhere and pull them aside for a question, that's not right. That's not what you do. Now, I'm not talking about asking them a question like, hey, what's going on with this or what's going on with that? But, you know, real deep questions, trying to get challenge somebody on what they believe. Um, you know, that's not what we do here. If I run into somebody who gets saved in a different church, I don't start pepper them with questions. <clears throat> you know, well, and that's awesome. High five. Move on, you know. <clears throat> but whatever. So those who question everything without speaking to those on staff, so they weren't talking to Paul, they pick out people for their questions. It's like checking doorknobs. Gossiping isn't always, you know, when we go and we start trying to sow discord. Sometimes gossip is just as simple as, you know, just, you know, you're going around a building. You're not breaking in. You're just checking doorknobs, see if you can find anything unlocked so that you can go in. And that's what people then do. Or they, you know, they say, hey, we need to pray about this or something of that nature and get it all spiritual. Uh, but normal looking people who sow discord. This is not talking, I do believe, I don't think this is talking about religious elite people going from church to church and trying to change them. Could be. But it's, it's not what I picture now. The Galatians were saved people. However, people were coming in and telling them that they had to do certain things follow certain laws in order to be saved. Now let's be clear, the only way to be saved is to believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it, nothing more, nothing less. As a matter of fact, after somebody's saved, even if they teach something contrary to that, doesn't mean they lose their salvation, does it? Just means you become a false, t- feature, false teacher, a saved false teacher. Because if we attach proper teaching onto somebody in order for them to keep their salvation, we have now added to salvation. And we're not going to do that. We don't point around saying, well, that person's not saved, that person. We don't, we don't know who's saved. It's only if we put faith in Christ. However, when you become a false teacher, Paul has some definitive things to say about that. So, um, there are people who think that sowing doubt in your heart and in your mind helps you. Or just passing on their struggles to somebody who can't handle it. Um, if I were to go around the church and think, you know, there are some things, some discussions that I've had. You know, like, for instance, Pastor Matt, we've had a lot of conversations in the last two and a half, three years, whatever it's been. We're working on three years now, aren't we? Thanksgiving three years ago. And, yeah. and uh, you know, we've had some pretty in-depth conversations. But you know what? I'm not out here, you know, pulling aside our, I'm not going to go pull aside Clay and start talking about those things, Right. I'm not going to start pulling aside, you know, other people in the church. You know, if I have discussions for something, you know, so what we do is we put a weight on somebody that they aren't designed to carry, and we shouldn't do that either. So that being started, we already read the first couple verses last week, but uh, we'll just cover them real quick if you don't mind. So last week we already gave a complete introductory uh, lesson to this. It is on YouTube if you want to go back and watch it. So look here, Galatians chapter one and verse one. Paul, an apostle. Not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So these false teachers had come in and they were, they were questioning Paul's authority. I'm sorry, as an apostle. Um, I made a joke last week. I don't feel bad about that joke, but I'm not going to repeat the joke. Uh, we talked about Matthias. We talked about Paul, who's going to be the 12th uh, name on the foundation of New Jerusalem. And I have no idea if it's Paul or Matthias. Um, my ordination is of men and by men. Pastor Matt's is of men and by men. However, Paul's wasn't. 
He got his ordination directly from Jesus Christ on the way to the road to Demaeus. Wow. It would be interesting if Emmaus and Damascus were on the same road. But uh, on his way to Damascus, <laughs> took you a second, huh, there, Angela? No, I caught it. I just waited for you. So I look here at verse 2, and again, speeding through these first couple. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Now notice here there, all the brethren. Don't picture Paul going around these different churches, and it was just him by himself. There were groups of people. Uh, there was, weren't just three wise men coming over. Uh, if you traveled in these days, you traveled, you traveled with, with people. Uh, it was safer. And, uh, and, you know, there'd be wives there. there. There'd be kids. There'd be all these people that are moving and going around as well. So we have here somewhat of a cold um, intro, but remember it's to the churches in Galatia, like Ephesus, Philippians, Colossians. Those letters are written directly to a church. Galatians is written to all the churches in a certain area. Um, so churches, uh, it did refer to churches of Galatia as a collective church. They're all local. And so I made this statement last week. Believers should be identified with a local church body. And that's not even a controversial statement. It shouldn't be. A Christian should be in church. And look here in verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the, Fa- God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, formal and typical greeting. And uh, so now let's hit it here. This is about where we're at. All right, verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So Paul is starting off here very clear. The, The whole center of Galatians, the whole center of the church, the whole center of the Bible is Jesus Christ. Um. You know, you, you probably see on occasion people talk about the difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. You all understand that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. It's all the same person. It's all the same Godhead. Uh, there's not, you know, well, the same God who, you know, called down fires, you know, forgive one another. Well, there's reasons why those things are different. Uh, one of them is everything's channeling through Israel and the rest of, you know, everything. It's not my job to, you know, take down a foreign government or to protect, you know, the New Testament isn't about that. The Old Testament, or the New Testament is about that, but the Old is. But Paul makes it very clear. It was Jesus who gave himself for us. Um, and the rest of the book is going to be solidifying this whole idea. How dare you think that you can do anything to justify or earn salvation? The audacity, the stubbornness, it's just off the charts for us to think that we could earn our way to heaven. One other thing I want to point out in this verse, and you probably saw that earlier and thought we were going to talk about Christmas. We are not. But notice it said there, according, and we're still in verse 4, according to the will of God and our Father. Who's God referring to there? In the Trinity. So you're referring to Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit, right? I want to show you some other places where this happens. Now, normally I have a problem having turning, but uh, I just want to go over these real quick. Go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now watch this. For unto us a child is born. And and so a child, that's still okay. That doesn't really, that's not a doctrinal son-father thing. But notice here it says, unto us a son is given. And of course it's Old Testament, so son isn't going to be capitalized. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. So the Son is called the Father, the Prince of Peace. And so when it says a child is born unto us, a son is given, it's obviously talking about Jesus Christ. And this is about 500 years before Jesus is born. So the Son is called the Father. Look here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Huh. So who's God there referring to? Yeah, it has to be, that almost has to be the Holy Spirit, right? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So there we have the Holy Spirit clearly being called God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Notice the and there. Now you could be kind of repeating and saying the same things over and, and referring to the same God. But however, God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, God himself there referring clearly as the Holy Spirit as God. Hebrews 1.8. But unto the Son, he saith, of course, now we have New Testament. We know who the Son definitively is. It's Jesus Christ. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. So Jesus here is called God, plainly. There's no question all throughout Scripture that uh, Jesus Christ is God. But, you know, you try to differentiate between God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and you can't do it. Um, you know, they're interchangeable. I had a guy, our first ever parade we did. Remember we had those postcards, I'm not sure who remembers it, and they had a picture of me on the po my po the postage stamp was my picture and had the serrated edges around it. But it had a prayer on there that talked about praying to Jesus. I had somebody call me up from a different church and say, no, the Bible says, Jesus said, when I leave, you no longer pray to me. You, or, no. Yeah, you pray, no, when I'm gone, you don't pray to me, you pray to the Father. Yeah, that got a five-page letter back from me. But, you know, I don't do those letters anymore. But it was pretty good. I still have it on my computer if you ever want to read it. Revelation, chapter 1, verse 6. And God and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Again, God referring plainly to Jesus Christ. And now, so what we have here is we have the Trinity. A word not mentioned in Scripture. The word Trinity is not anywhere. Neither is rapture, neither is not, but the word Bible isn't in the Bible. And so we let people get you know, hung up on that sort of thing. But I want to show you. Rapture is in the, in the Latin vulgate of the Bible. Rapturia yes, or something like that. It's Latin. Good call. Not in the English. No, not in the English. Yeah. And uh, so early on, somebody made a comment to me, and uh, when I was a teenager, just you know, freshly saved. Well, you know, the Bible, at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, when it talks about God, in the Hebrew, it's plural. So there are gods. Man, I let that throw me off for a while. It's like, oh, I wonder why it does that. Uh, not only does the Hebrew make it plural, but the English does as well. In Genesis, all I do is open my Bible to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image. So all the way from after our likeness. All the way from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Trinity is there. So the implication that, that Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead is all throughout Scripture, everywhere. Uh, Islam, uh, Muslims will now claim, well, Jesus never accepted worship or claimed himself to be God. No, John chapter 8, he said, before Abraham was, Abraham was, I am and they picked up stones to kill him. So they knew what he was saying, but, you know, it's funny, we, we, we can't read into it. We're so worried about what the Bible says and so what the Bible teaches. And so the Bible teaches plainly all over the place the Trinity. All of them are God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Don't try to overthink this. Well, today, well, matter of fact, today I'm going to pray to Jesus. Today I'm going to pray to the Father. Today I'm going to pray to the Spirit. Do you think they're all getting offended that you're doing this? That you're addressing your prayer to God the Father? The Holy Spirit's all of a sudden been out of shape because you said Father instead of Spirit? Don't overthink it. Just pray to God. Pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray to the Father. They're all okay with this. And, uh, but however, so when we get back here to Galatians, see, Matt is a little hot right here, right now. Yeah. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you're used to the Mojave Desert. <laughs> Holy cow. Thank you. Well, I mean, I can also turn it down from up here. You can have that control if you want. It's up to you. I'll give you the app. All right. Verse 5. So, again, Paul... Making it clear, Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead. And he's also going to back up his calling as being an apostle here in a moment. So here, verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. So ever and ever, forward, backwards, Jesus Christ. It's a good pause here. Give glory to God because we're nice, we're kind. Matter of fact, we're still going to be kind. But man, Paul's about to hit them. Because they've allowed false doctrine to come in. 
Look here, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And that's the thesis of the entire book. Right there, that's a statement. Now we're going to back it up for you know one other five and a half chapters. Paul's not happy. This isn't nice. And Paul is going to be very clear on what our opinion of false ta- teachers and false teaching should be. We have, oh, just we're, we all believe the same thing. That's not what Paul says. The gospel, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is it. It's the only way to heaven. It's the only way we're saved. Um, so it's just interesting, though, that those that would be Judaizers, that's, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, everything you read on, that's what they call these people trying to bring them back under the law. They're not arguing the facts of the gospel. They're not denying the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What they're doing is they're changing the interpretation of the gospel. What's it look like after? <clears throat> Paul doesn't go far enough. You've got to keep the law of Moses. You've got to have your kids circumcised. You've got to, you know, you got to do this. You've got to do that. And that's just not the way it is. Adding things to the gospel changes the gospel. But what we do, we have to be careful of. It's okay, though, to have standards, right? We all have standards of something, but what happens is when somebody has high, much higher standards than ours, what do we do? We get offended by them when we call them legalists, right? Let somebody have higher standards than you. Be happy for them. If somebody, you know, I've ebbed and flowed through my life, you know, one time I didn't, and we, had, we went years without a TV in our house, and uh, that Nick Gillespie would look at this Nick Gillespie, man, that kid's a compromise. Well, that old man is a compromiser. And, uh, but <laughs> she's shaking her head up and down. <laughs> and uh, did I get in your case for half a month? No. You were in the dorms. Yeah, okay. I'm just saying, the Lord spoke to you four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Lord spoke and it should have been done. You know the first thing we ever watched when we came back? Wayne's No. Had I had it? Remember that old, big old computer monitor that I had up there? You know, Con Air. <laughs> you compromised for a Nick Cage movie? <laughs> That's all you have. <laughs> Name me a movie without Con- Nicolas Cage in it. <laughs> What's the one, the Ghost Rider? Was that? that Nicolas Cage. <laughs> Wayne rolled on around and cleaned it up. Well, did it? All right. So for those of you that don't know, Nicholas Cage, he's a missionary. I think he's a missionary to L.A. area somewhere. But, you know, it's funny. You know, dress standards, whatever the case is, and people get bent out of shape if they're higher. Don't get bent out of shape if somebody has higher standards than you. I'm not going to get bent out of shape if you have lower. But what we do then is we throw the term legalism at it. And so what legalism is, is legalism is when we add things to the gospel. If I say you can't get saved if you have a TV in your house, that's legalism. If I have the standard that I don't have TV in my house, and I get behind the pulpit and say neither should you, that's probably me stepping over my bounds, but it's not legalism. Until I tie it to salvation. Having a higher standard doesn't automatically make something legalism. Okay? What legalism is, is it's adding things to the gospel. It's adding circumcision. It's adding baptism. It's adding church attendance. It's adding when the plate goes by, you better put something in it. Those are the things that make legalism. If you have to do anything to be saved. But it's interesting. Those that would accuse then us of legalism, add things to the gospel, then call us legalists. It's the craziest thing, and I'll illustrate that real quick. We don't have to have a standard to get to heaven. We have a standard because we're trying to do better and to be better. We believe the Lord has something for us. Um, but everybody has a standard. That's what the funny thing is. No matter what, where you make fun of somebody else's standard, you have a standard on it as well. It just might be a little bit lower. You know, we, we've talked about you know, in the Bible, there's, everybody has a line. We have, a, we have a music line. We have a movie line. We have a TV. Everybody has a line on everything. But that's for me, and that's not for to go to somebody else. We're trying in many areas to please the Lord, and it has nothing to do with salvation. Nothing. Absolutely nothing to do with salvation. 
One of the things I'm going to talk about this coming Sunday morning. Remember, salvation isn't about doing good and doing bad. Salvation isn't about the things I do. Versus, you know, once you get saved, you got to do this. You got to do that. No, salvation is the difference between being alive and being dead. Either you're alive or you're dead. You're saved or you're not. It's not about works. But once we're saved, we're expected to do certain things. That's where that's where um, that's where confusion comes for some people. We have conviction. I can't just go out and do something and did, did the Lord not tap me on the shoulder and be under conviction. So that conviction then I can confuse with salvation. It's not the same thing. And, and so these people here could have been good-hearted people that are working their way all the way. Well, we don't want anybody you know, not saved. We want to make sure everybody's you know, good on this and we'll go around church to church and do what they think is right. But just because you think it's right doesn't make it right. When we first started going to a church like ours in New Jersey, as in the Air Force in New Jersey, we, well, we were there, but I was in the Air Force. And uh, we had started going out and knocking on doors and trying to get people the gospel. And we happened to, li- we lived by this pond, I, I suppose. And there was a guy there. And at the time, I was a little bit, I was probably, I should probably get back to there. I was a little bit more bold with the gospel than I am now. And I saw a guy sitting at the table. And I started going his direction, talk to him. Come to find out he goes to a church. And then he started getting on my case because, you know, you go out and soul and you go witness to people. You give somebody the gospel. And they don't, because he said, if they don't repent, they're not saved. And you just made them think you are. Okay, well, there's different definitions of repent. But then he looked at a verse and showed it to me and said, Godly sorrow worketh repentance, not to be repented of, right? Well, yeah, that's a thing. If I feel bad for something I've done, if I have conviction for something I've done, godly sorrow makes me stop doing it, but it doesn't get me any closer to heaven. And so what that guy has done is, you know, the whole pendulum thing swung it way back too far. I'm going to witness to you. I'm going to tell you how to be saved, but until you're bawling, I'm not going to actually pray with you, and, and, and you, we're not going to finish this whole process. I'm going to work on you for months. I'm going to work on you for weeks. I'm going to spend time making sure you know what's going on. We should be careful of the gospel. I mean, don't get me wrong, right? We're not confusing that. But what I've come to the conclusion of, and I think Paul's going to talk about this a little bit, very few people truly believe the gospel. The gospel is salvation by faith through grace alone, nothing added, absolutely nothing added, and it's forever, and it's eternal. I didn't need to say both those things. It is forever, it is eternal. You don't get it by works, and you can't keep it by works. So then what separates every cult and every ism in the world adds something to salvation. You have to do this. You have to get baptized. You have to come to our church. You have to dress a certain way. And those are all things that add to salvation, make it legalism. And by the way, there could be a saved person who has now been bamboozled by these people in Galatia teaching somebody a perverted version of the gospel Anybody get mad at me say, don't get mad at me if you're saying perverted because it's going to come from the Bible in a minute. Teaching a perverted version of the gospel, therefore it could be a saved person teaching it and then getting converts who aren't even going to be going to heaven when they die. Because remember, I'm saved. You don't know that. I do. I've trusted Christ as my Savior. Now, we can start teaching from this pulpit that you have to be baptized to go to heaven. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to do that. I'm still saved. My salvation doesn't go away because I teach false teachings. However, when I start telling people they have to be baptized in order to go to heaven, that person, now I've soured it for him. I'm telling him that he has to believe something that's not true. Don't put your faith in Jesus. Put your faith in this. And then imagine this. uh, I can't imagine facing Jesus having, having, having taught that stuff. So, remember I used the word pervert? We're going to show why. I, pervert, pervert. I feel like it should have a different in this meaning. Pervert the gospel of Christ, not pervert, right? Pervert. Anyways, look at verse 7. So which is not another. So there is no such thing as another gospel. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's pretty strong language. Pervert. 
I can even take you to the Greek and show you a little bit of that stuff. I don't want to, but it's, it's a pretty strong uh, thing about change. So what are the false teachers trying to get them to change? Are the false teachers trying to get them to commit fornication? Are the false teachers trying to get them to worship idols? Is the, Worship Satan? Throw their babies to the god of Molech? Make their kids pass through the fire? Is that what these false teachers are trying to get them to do? No, those are the things that we would say, man, that's evil. These people are just telling them, hey, you need to get circumcised. You need to not work on Saturday. That, when, when Paul's calling them, you've perverted the gospel, they're simply teaching that you cannot do anything on Saturday. It, otherwise, you're going to hell. Galatians 2.21, if you want to flip over that, it might even be on the same page you're on right now. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the, come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If I could earn my way to heaven, there'd be no point in Jesus dying on the cross. Can you imagine? You're God the Father, and Jesus is dying on the cross, but yet there's another way for humanity to be saved. Would you go through with it? No. It's ridiculous. It's not even logical. It's not even logical to think there's another way to heaven. When people ask the question, why do you think your religion is right? Well, it's the only one that makes logical sense. The only one. Jesus, God is holy. I cannot attain to him. Therefore, he sent his son as a perfect sacrifice for me to then attain. Otherwise, what am I doing? Am I getting baptized? Where? How? Am I going to church? Well, which one? Well, you have to stop sinning. Well, I've never done that. Well, you have to be sorry for all your sins. I haven't been sorry for all my sins. Well, you have to wish that you didn't do them. Uh, I can't remember them. There might be some that I'm really not sorry about. Right? <clears throat> there is no other gospel. The enduring heresy of having to do something to get to heaven has been there from the beginning. A work salvation is doing plus salvation. Or, do, or work salvation doing plus believing. I met a pastor recently, and uh, not going to mention church or anything of that nature. Uh, but I met this pastor, and we're talking, and you know, that was complimentary. I said, hey, whenever we run into people from your church, they always know they're saved. That's half the battle right there, right? We know this. You know, I told them there's certain churches that we just know when we, when we run into them, they're not going to know. Baptist churches, that they aren't going to know, for, they, don't, they don't know if they're saved or not. And I said, but, you know, people from here do. And he couldn't just accept that. Well, you know, you know, these, they have to, prove, he started then backing it. Well, back, not backing up, but actually backing up. Well, well you know, we have to, pers- you know, those people, when they get saved, they, you know, we need to keep doing good works, right? We need to keep it. That's not the answer Paul would have gave. Yeah, man, that we teach salvation. We teach it simple. But he couldn't just stick to it. Which, by the way, did I say he's not, he's not saved? Saved. I assume he is. But he had to disqualify the simplicity that was found in Christ. We don't want to sound simple, do we? We want, it, we want to be educated. We want the degrees after our name. We want all of that stuff. But the simplicity is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's my job to tell people about the simplicity of salvation. It's not my job to control their actions after salvation. You know, it's like scaring them into staying straight, right? I get behind the pulpit. Man, bless God, you know, if you don't give a certain percent to this church, I don't know, I don't know if you're saved. Guess what? You're going to think, well, you know, kind of, and if you put that much faith in me, which nobody in this church does, I'm glad you don't. Uh, but, you know, you put that much faith in somebody, well, that's your first mistake. But all of a sudden, now you think, well, I better do that. I better write a check. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's silly. But I will say this, I am an independent Baptist because I believe independent Baptists are the closest to being correct about salvation. And if there was anybody more correct or anybody closer, I would be that. Should we keep going? Verse eight. Okay, now now wait, we just in verse seven, Paul just used the word pervert and would pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, not asking to do something nefarious, just asking them to cut their foreskins off. Okay, let's be clear about this. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than we, than we, we yeah. 
than that which we have preached unto you. Notice these words, let him be accursed. Now, the thought process here, when it talks about an angel from heaven preaching the gospel or another gospel, is that hyperbole? It seems so that at the time of Paul that there probably weren't angels coming and preaching any sort of gospel, right? But, and, and right now that would be hyperbole, or we'd think so. But could it be during the tribulation what's going to happen? Who is going to be preaching what? Who's going to be saying what? And who knows? But Paul here, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. And if this is inspired scripture, which I believe it is, Paul is serious, but it also means God's serious. False teaching is a bad thing. Now let's back up for a second. Where does that false teaching begin and end? And that's what we need to be careful of. You know, we're not right 100% of the time. I just hope we figure out what we're wrong on soon, right? Sooner than uh, later. But we have to draw lines. You have to. But when it comes to salvation, the only line is belief. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. Don't turn that, I'll read it to you. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, who end, whose end shall be according to their works. Interesting. Not, you know, Satan didn't come in religious garb. Came as an angel. Or even at the Garden of Eden as a snake and said, what? Go, go kill somebody. No, hath God said. So let's be clear. You've, you've seen this before. I'm not going to put it up here. But Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The Philippian jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? What did they say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he did throw in, and your house. It doesn't mean if I believe, my house is going to say, it, you can be believed. But you know what, and your house. We're going to go tell them too, right? We're only saved through faith. <clears throat> Saved by grace through faith, and it's the only way. Which, by the way, even when we're talking about the law and going backwards, people, even in law in the law era, were still only saved by faith, by grace through faith. They weren't saved by keeping the law. All right, verse nine. Well, unless you thought that verse eight was a mistake, and we said before, and so now I say again: If any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye, than that ye have received. Let him be accursed. Paul's defense of the gospel and those who teach differently here cannot be overstated. He's pretty serious. He wishes them to be damned. There's this thing that we occasionally deal with, you know, wayward people, and they go to church that doesn't preach the gospel. Well, at least they're in church. Sorry if you say that to me, I'm not going to agree with you. Well, they, they might be in a social club somewhere. But at least their church. Well, would Paul agree with that statement? Yeah, I don't want to use church names. But, you know, one of the larger churches in Springfield now building another building. Uh, I've spoken to the staff there. They plainly believe that you must be baptized in order to go to heaven. But yet, you know, hey, just go there. No, no, it's no big deal. <laughs> Yeah, but if we're telling somebody at the, time, at the moment we're get, witnessing to them, hey, Jesus died for you. Now, if you get baptized, you go to heaven. Is that person going to get saved? No. And that's a problem. Then we take our kids in there. Oh, there's, they have such nice kids programs. Hey, kids, you know what? If you, you know, there's death, burial, resurrection, Jesus Christ, and all you have to do is be baptized, you go to heaven. Now, all of a sudden, our kids walk out of there thinking they're saved when they're not. And that's not a big deal. It is a big deal. See, Judaizers, G-J-U-D-A-I-Z-E-R-S, didn't deny the facts of the gospel. They denied that the gospel was adequate for salvation. But do we take these statements seriously? Do we really believe what Paul's saying here? Human nature's off on this. We all believe it's in the back of our heads. If I was God... There would, be, there would be conditions. If I was God, yes, you'd have to be in church. 
I wouldn't give my son, and then you just don't ever show up to church again. You don't ever do right. You don't ever do anything. And you still get to go to heaven? If I was God, that wouldn't be the case. <clears throat> so because I think that way, I assign that to God, and that's not how God thinks. Because the truth is, if we thought like that, if God was like that, there wouldn't be anybody saying it. <clears throat> Sorry, don't know why I'm <clears throat> getting froggy all of a sudden. <clears throat> Human nature is off on this. If we feed people, great. If we give them shots, great. If we pay their bills, great. But if we ask them, hey, are you saved? Now all of a sudden that's a problem. That's a personal affront, right? When we used to, we spent two years at that building on the corner of, uh, I think it's 19th Centennial, there for two years. And it's interesting, there was another place that was renting a, another spot that was a little bit closer to Bymart. I went over to pay our bill one time you know, we're out there door to door giving people the gospel. And the, and the owner of the properties mentioned that, yeah, this other place, we give them a discount every December. And I said, oh, really? Yeah, why? Because they do this program where they're out giving bread to the community. This person goes to church. I'm like, well, we're, I was a little younger then. How many years ago was that? 13, 14 years ago. So how old I was, you know, I'm saying, well... I guess maybe I should have said it even a little bit forcefully, but we're given the gospel. I mean, yeah. But if we were out handing people bread, which I'm glad to do, I'm not against it. But if we're going to hand somebody bread, we're also going to give them the gospel. Because a full stomach, but not going to hell, not going to heaven, I die. There's no point. Well, technically, you would be bread. Good point. <laughs> there you go. I like it. Verse 10. And by the way, on this stuff, we're going to get a little bit more specific and doctrinal when we come to salvation. We come to uh, salvation by grace when we get a little bit further on in the letter. But we're still a little bit in an introduction. Verse 10, for now, uh, for do I now persuade men or God? Do I change God's mind or do I change people's mind? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So everything we do should be for the glory of God. Modern Christianity, oh, 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 we're at time. Modern Christianity is not is looking not for a savior, but for a helper, a motivation, something to get them through it. Now, if Rory is saved, and that's the thing, that's fun. I'm not against that. But uh, however, you know, Jesus is more than a motivator. He's more than a helper. Uh, he's our God. He's our Savior. He's the one that died, bled for us. Uh, went to hell for a short amount of time. Not sure what that time frame was because the Bible talks very plainly. He went to the, the heart of the earth, but then rose again victorious and then ascended up to the Father. He did that so we can go to heaven. And if there's any other way to do it, if there's any other way to be saved, he would have told us about it. And with that, it's 745. Any questions? All right, we have a lot of stuff to cover in our staff meetings after this. And uh, so uh, probably a lot of things to cover with you. And we have to do that song, so I'll be back there with that as well. So um, I'll go ahead and cut the pleasantries and go ahead and pray and uh, be uh, done. But, you know, there's coffee, stuff like that in there. Um, anything else we need to talk about? I feel like I'm forgetting something. There's a lot of stuff we need to talk about tonight, but... All right. Father, again, we are thankful for our...